Sony Ericsson was born in 2001, a legendary collab between the Japanese powerhouse Sony and the Swedish telecom giant Ericsson. Ericsson, a 125-year-old brand at the time, was a big player in communication systems, even rocking the first ever smartphone back in the day. Sony, on the other hand, had been killing it for 55 years in computers, cameras, and all kinds of electronics. Post-war Japan's economy rose from the ashes thanks in part to Sony's success. Even Jobs was a Sony fanboy, taking cues from them. By 2005, Sony Ericsson phones were killing it, being imitated by Nokia and other players. But by 2011, it was game over. People blame Sony for the tragedy, but I think both companies are guilty. Sup, Internet? Get ready to learn about the mistakes that led to the epic crash of Sony Ericsson. What happened to the Walkman brand, and how PlayStation ended up being the wrecking ball for a brand that was later built with blood, sweat, and tears? Let's rewind. Both companies were doing well until 2001, and their paths hadn't crossed. But fate threw a curveball at Ericsson in 2000. A Philips factory, the sole supplier of chips for Nokia and Ericsson, went up in flames. While Nokia quickly adapted, Ericsson thought the burnt-down factory would be back in business in no time. Wrong move. It took over half a year to rebuild, costing them a fortune. They had to tighten their belts, cut jobs, and the mobile division was bleeding money. To save it, they needed a massive cash injection. The Swedes weren't keen on investing, especially when their contracts with telecom operators and TV companies were raking in the dough. But in December 2000, Sony pitched the idea of a joint brand, and they were in. Ericsson phones were a hit, strong radio signals, and killer designs. But by the late 90s, competition was fierce, and Ericsson lost 30% of the market in just a year. Against Nokia, their phones looked dull, and people were clowning on their antennas. Sony had its mobile division too. Great multimedia phones, but they never hit it big. Globally, Sony had less than 1% of the market, and by 2000, even that sliver was shrinking, thanks again to Nokia. Nokia was a powerhouse, and competing with them solo was impossible. Then comes 2001. Agreement signed, mobile divisions merged. Sony Ericsson had 3,500 employees worldwide with headquarters in London. Bills were piling up, phones weren't rolling out. The first Sony Ericsson phone, the T68i, dropped in 2002. Bureaucracy took over a year to sort out legal and tech issues, form the lineup, and merge ideas. The T68i was basically a copy of Ericsson's T68, the flagship before the Sony merger, and the world's first mass-market phone with a color screen. Siemens technically had the first color screen phone, but it wasn't as widespread. The T68i had a detachable camera, Bluetooth, and infrared port. It gained some popularity, but it didn't reach legendary status. Sony Ericsson, as the name suggests, had both corporations holding equal shares. Sony, however, pumped in most of the cash, handle design, and led marketing in several markets. Ericsson focused on hardware, set specs, and researched markets. The Swedes owned a bunch of patents that Sony didn't, forming the basis for future phones. Sony Ericsson kicked off out of desperation. Two outsiders with internal disagreements. Ericsson doubted future success and saw no beauty in this union. Launching a new brand was tough, and Sony Ericsson was in the red for a while. Building from scratch and competing with aggressive Nokia, Motorola, Siemens took its time. Successful phone products at the start, but it took time for the investments to pay off. Ericsson's top brass rushed things, pressured by the subsidiary wanting super profits ASAP. The T68i sales didn't bring much profit due to high costs. They then released a simplified version, the T300, followed by the T310. They gained popularity, but the market wanted cheap phones. Sony Ericsson dropped budget phones like the T200 and T600. The $100 T100 became a hit, owning the budget market. With lower production costs, they brought in more profit. But despite the success, the company was still in the red. All the money was going into advertising, developing new tech, and more. From 2002 to 2003, representatives of Ericsson not only exerted internal pressure on Sony Ericsson, but also publicly discussed the possibility of exiting the business. Why are you running? 
and ceasing any funding of the joint venture if the first profit was not achieved. It had been almost three years since its establishment, but there were no signs of any income. In response, Sony publicly stated that they saw no problems and the enterprise would continue to be fully funded. This communication between Ericsson and Sony executives took place through newspapers and economic journals, negatively impacting not only the reputation of the young brand but also the internal atmosphere of the company. It wasn't just the first disagreements, it marked the beginning of corporate animosity. It took just a small spark to destroy the joint venture. Despite the tensions, the new conglomerate quickly became a serious threat to Nokia. Yes, the initial models were Ericsson clones, but in 2003, powerful phones were released, boosting the popularity of the brand, and competitors watched in horror as this situation changed rapidly. The main instigator of this upheaval was the iconic Sony Ericsson T610. Until 2005, all Sony Ericsson phones were developed by Ericsson engineers with minimal influence from Sony. The company consistently released interesting models, and even though it lost market share due to its rapid growth, it increased sales in units. The introduction of the T610 caused a sensation. Years later, the T1000 would continue the line and go back in time to kill John Connor. Are you even listening to what I'm saying? Hello? The T610 was an expensive, status symbol targeted at top managers and businessmen. It earned the title of an unequivocal bestseller, and in many countries it sold so quickly that a natural shortage occurred. In the same year, based on the T610, Sony Ericsson released the T630 and the Z600, the company's first flip phone. Another significant product of 2003 was the Sony Ericsson P900 with an additional QWERTY keyboard and stylus. It operated on the Symbian 7.0 OS with the UIQ overlay, developed by UIQ Technology with active support from Sony Ericsson and Motorola. It significantly expanded the capabilities of Symbian, making it suitable for touchscreen phones. Remember this information. Insignificant at first glance, but it will definitely overturn history. The previous year's P800 is considered the company's first smartphone. But the P900 not only replicated the success of its predecessor, but it surpassed it. Surprisingly, when it was released, there were already Windows Mobile PDAs. However, many preferred the P900 because its interface was simpler and more understandable. Nevertheless, the company remained unprofitable. The first quarter of 2003 brought in losses of 116 million euros. In the second quarter, the company lost an additional 102 million. Sony joined the pressure from Ericsson. Where's the money? Sony Ericsson. Both parent companies pressed on their joint venture to finally start making a profit. Otherwise, it would have to be shut down. By that time, Sony Ericsson held a 6% share of the global phone market. Only in the third quarter of 2003 managed to bring in a profit of 39 million euros. The company earned from numerous budget phones because the market demanded affordable devices, which the company could not produce due to high production costs. Therefore, they ordered them in Taiwan and sold them under their brand. For example, at the end of 2003, the Sony Ericsson Z200 was released, produced by Arima, under an ODM order. There were, of course, more such devices. Listing them is pointless, and the Z200 was somewhat familiar to our consumers. In 2004, strong solutions emerged from other manufacturers, and the market demanded a new hit from Sony Ericsson. This is when the legendary Sony Ericsson K700i was introduced. At the start, it was priced at 400 euros, cheaper than its competitors. Despite the lower price, it boasted a 40 MB of built-in memory, an MP3 player, a VGA camera interpolated up to 1.3 megapixels, FM radio, support for 3D Java games, a new high-quality TFT screen, and an updated menu. The K700i outclassed competitors and could compete with Nokia 6230 and Motorola E398. It was a resounding success and the company reported colossal profits. In 2004, it earned over 300 million euros and its market share grew to 7%. Things were on the upswing. The manufacturer gained mega popularity and subsequently released several devices that set a new standard for quality. 
the Sony Ericsson K700i remained the flagship throughout 2004. The company quickly understood the direction to move in and later released its younger sibling, the K500i, priced at €250 Euros at launch. It had less memory, up to 12 megabytes, omitted Bluetooth, and lacked FM radio. The success of the K700i led the company to experiment, resulting in the release of the swivel-designed Sony Ericsson S700. The form factor was new, and the experiment was successful. The device had many features, including a large 320x240 screen and a memory stick duo memory card slot, also used in other company phones and the PSP. Although the Sony Ericsson S700 didn't become a mega hit, it found its buyer and became an indicator of the company's technological prowess. Later, it even started the race for megapixels, which other manufacturers also joined. The S700 had a 1.3 megapixel camera, and its photo quality surpassed most models at that time. The company realized that there was demand for good cameras, and in the future, cameras would become the killer feature of Sony Ericsson. Sony Ericsson reached its peak in 2005. Budget models like K300 and K600 were released first, initially trim versions of the K500 and the K700 with the same price tag. Fans wondered why anyone would buy them when K500 and K700 were available for the same money. Then budget phones Sony Ericsson T290i, J210, and J300 were released. Their sales were extremely low, revealing a serious problem. The company had nothing to offer in the price range of $100 to $200. But then, the new flagship Sony Ericsson K750 was released, setting the benchmark for style and functionality that other manufacturers aspired to. The excitement around the model was immense and it flew off the shelves at the speed of light. The phone became iconic and still enjoys respect with fond memories from fans. The K750i was the first mass-market device with a 2-megapixel camera and solidified the brand's status as the best provider of mobile cameras. Neither Samsung nor Nokia could compete with its photo capabilities. From this moment on, Sony Ericsson became a leader in camera technology. By the way, you might be wondering, what's the difference between K750 and K750i? There is no difference. It's just labeling for specific markets. With or without it, they were the same devices. The Sony Ericsson K750i came out at the right time during the heyday of mobile internet. You could download ICQ and communicate with friends, make new acquaintances. It could also transfer games to other devices. Built-in programs on the phone allowed photo and video editing, creating melodies, and even identifying music through Track ID app available only on Sony Ericsson devices. Yes, they had their own Shazam in 2005. Sony Ericsson took a bold step by introducing a lineup of music phones under the Walkman brand, which had previously been associated with cassette and digital players, but lost its value to the iPod. Interestingly, in Guardians of the Galaxy, Peter Quill also uses a Sony Walkman cassette player. The Walkman brand became a hallmark of Sony Ericsson, with the first Walkman phone being the W800i. Essentially the same as the K750, but in a different casing and with advanced headphones included. It had slightly modified software. Interestingly, hardware-wise, it was exactly the same as the K750, but the Walkman received high praise for its outstanding sound. The strength of the brand played a significant role, along with the high-quality headphones that couldn't be compared to most mediocre stock earphones. Music lovers rushed to buy them in just a few days. At that time, MP3 players were expensive and these models supported all popular music formats. Although many fell for the marketing and the brand, replacing their players with the W800i, all they needed to do was buy different headphones. Another brand obtained from Sony was Cybershot, used for phones with quality cameras. The first phone released under this brand, the K790i, was a continuation of the K750 and came out in 2006. But let's not rush events, we're still in 2005. The most successful year brought both the company's greatest successes and its biggest problems. According to statistics, more than half of all joint ventures failed to meet expected results, often due to cultural clashes, 
and inability to communicate effectively and collaborate on a daily basis. The same happened with Sony Ericsson, internal wars being parent companies and their sub-brands flourished within the company. Inspired by the resounding success, Sony engineers were full of plans, including the release of a gaming device in 2006. They even filed a patent for it, recognizing the significant market niche it presented. However, when Sony learned of all these plans, they didn't just express displeasure, they threw a full-blown tantrum. After all, the PlayStation 3 and portable consoles were set to launch in 2006. Sony Ericsson had no intention of using the PlayStation logo or integrating into its ecosystem. However, Sony demanded that the company immediately cease any development of gaming phones, fearing competition for their portable consoles. No arguments persuaded Sony, and the leadership refused to understand that if Sony Ericsson didn't create its gaming phone, someone else would. It was only a matter of time. As history shows, that's exactly what happened. This conflict became the spark in the powder keg. Unintentionally, Sony Ericsson, with its actions, ignited an internal corporate war for which no one was prepared. Sony decided it needed to control any processes within Sony Ericsson to prevent liabilities such as development of gaming phones. Top managers at Sony fought for influence, contested various decisions, and even sabotaged tasks that, in their opinion, harmed the parent company. Making Sony Ericsson function as a cohesive, united, and integral company was challenging. Sony already had its person at the helm, Miles Flint, a CEO who was English but had previously worked at Sony. However, the Japanese still wanted more influence. 2006 proved to be the most successful year in the company's history with the sale of 100 million devices. Sony Ericsson introduced smartwatches and a Bluetooth car accessory. The notable Sony Ericsson K790, also known as K800i Cybershot, made a significant contribution to the company's success. While it was a continuation of the K750, it felt like something out of this world. It operated incredibly swiftly, handled graphic-intensive games, had superb sound quality, and hooked its owner up with the status of the neighborhood's ultimate player. Other standout models from 2006 include the Sony Ericsson W950i, competing with Nokia's 6233 and W700i. Many other models released that year were equally impressive. Feel free to share in the comments which Sony Ericsson model you had. As a result, Sony Ericsson surpassed LG and became the fourth largest mobile device manufacturer in the world. Expensive devices also started selling well, bringing in substantial profits and gaining support from mobile operators. Sony Ericsson was swimming in money and their brand advertising was everywhere. In June 2007, another iconic product was released, the Sony Ericsson W910i, a musical slender in the Walkman series. It allowed users to switch music by shaking the phone. It was designed as the main competitor for the slim sliders like the Samsung D90, and it sounded pretty good. The company outlined a stable development plan and believed that the direction of thin music phones would continue to be profitable for several more years. There were other promising developments such as the P-Series smartphones, budget image flip phones, and the Bravia phone lineup released in 2007 exclusively for the Japanese market. For the past four years, the company had been making good profits and there were no signs of trouble. However, in the fall of 2007, the first iPhone was released, turning the established mobile market upside down. Under the pressure of its popularity, giants like Nokia, BlackBerry, HTC, and many smaller brands were wiped off the face of the earth. Sony Ericsson couldn't compete with Apple, although desperate attempts were made to stay afloat. As a response to the iPhone, the Xperia lineup was created in 2008. The first phone in this series was the Sony Ericsson Xperia X1, running on Windows Mobile and developed with the help of HTC. The X1 was presented at MWC 2008 in January, but took a long time to hit the market, appearing only in October when there were already plenty of alternatives from other manufacturers. Interestingly, HTC took advantage of the situation and released the very similar HTC Touch Diamond. 
It was slightly less powerful than the X1, but significantly cheaper. Although the Sony Ericsson Xperia X1 sold well, it didn't become an iPhone killer. However, that's not the crucial point. In 2006, Sony Ericsson acquired UIQ technology, making it a subsidiary. Together, they developed the UIQ 3.3, which featured pleasant animations and functional application widgets like Google, YouTube, and Weather. A smartphone with the codename Sony Ericsson BB was supposedly to be released on this platform, but it was later cancelled, deemed unviable, and Sony Ericsson abandoned UIQ in favor of Windows Mobile. Despite Google already forming the Open Handset Alliance and actively developing the first Android at that time, Sony Ericsson didn't rush to adopt it. Even after its release, the company hesitated. Brand enthusiasts weren't eager to use devices with the declining Windows Mobile, but the company didn't provide another choice. Undoubtedly, the initial iPhones had numerous flaws, but thanks to multi-touch technology, they showed the world how to use smartphones without styluses. Windows Mobile PDAs looked outdated compared to them and quickly lost popularity, while Symbian shifted to the budget segment and seemed inadequate. Throughout this time, Apple was actively pulling the blanket onto itself and gaining an incredible fan base. By the way, the foundation for multi-touch was laid by Sony's developments, shamelessly swiped by Jobs. Sony Ericsson in 2008 started losing ground and slipped back to the fifth spot, trailing behind LG. Moreover, for the first time in four years, the company started facing losses. In 2008 alone, Sony Ericsson lost 73 million euros. Consumers were snatching up new iPhones and the demand for Sony Ericsson plummeted. Other manufacturers began slashing prices on their phones. On top of that, currency exchange rates began wildly fluctuating due to the global crisis of 2008. It was a tough situation. Something had to change urgently, a shift to new technologies. But what to change? Which technologies would be in demand? Panic set in at the company. However, the same state of panic gripped all other manufacturers. Internal disagreements with the company were also heating up and by his own choice, CEO Miles Flint stepped down. Hideki Komiyama, who, judging by the name, also seemed to be a Sony guy, took his place. He decided to implement massive layoffs to save the company. Until that moment, the number of Sony Ericsson employees worldwide had been increasing. Around 12,000 people worked for the company. However, in 2008, they announced plans to lay off 2,000 specialists worldwide within the next 12 months. In reality, more than 5,000 employees were let go, including the disbandment of the expensive research and development R&D department. R&D is a crucial department for any IT manufacturing company. Sony Ericsson closed it because scientific researchers were the highest paid specialists. By dissolving it, the company hoped to save money. However, this move was equivalent to surrender. It turned out that without the R&D department, the company could no longer produce innovative products. In the end, the decision to lay off the R&D department became the main reason for Sony Ericsson's downfall. Representative offices in different countries also got the axe. The brand had to exit many markets. The marketing department was left barren. As soon as things started smelling fishy, Ericsson immediately wanted to sell its share in the company to its partner. Japanese Sony wanted to buy out their 50% stake from their partner back then, but the Japanese didn't have the money for it at the time. Now let's talk about 2009. Google, along with other companies, polished its Android. Commercial smartphones on the new OS started flooding the market. Competition was growing not only from Apple, but also from Samsung, which, jumping onto the Android hype train, was speeding towards a bright future. But Sony Ericsson wasn't in a hurry to release Android novelties. Only in November 2009 did their first and now only Android device from Sony Ericsson hit the market, the Xperia X10. However, due to a lack of necessary specialists, integrating the green robot onto their smartphones proved very difficult. The device was constantly lagging, and numerous complaints poured in. Later, they had to quietly recall a large batch of these devices due to software issues, incurring additional expenses. 
Among somewhat sensible devices, there was the Xperia X2 on Windows Mobile. But otherwise, the lineup was absolute madness with strange shapes and whimsical names running on outdated operating systems. For example, that year saw the failed Xperia Pureness, a pricey phone with a transparent display. Even the authors themselves didn't know why they made it. Apparently, the principle, a samurai has no goal, only a path, kicked in. Also, there was the Green Heart series with a focus on eco-friendliness, featuring epileptic names like Sony Ericsson J110i2 Elm or Sony Ericsson J105 Nighty and even Sony Ericsson Jalu Dolce & Gabbana edition. Defects were increasingly found in the new releases. The company recalled a large batch of Sony Ericsson Anu due to touchscreen issues. Earlier, two major retail networks in the UK halted sales of Sony Ericsson Satio due to software problems. Yet these two models, Anio and Satio, were key products for the company. As a result, 2009 set all possible anti-records. Sony Ericsson's net loss for the year amounted to 836 million euros. Sales in units also sharply declined. While in 2008, they managed to sell 96.6 million devices, in 2009, it was only 57.1 million. Sony Ericsson's CEO Hideki Komiyama, who took the helm the previous year, predicted that the fall was inevitable, but would be within 5 to 7 percent, no more. In reality, the decline was very sharp, almost 50 percent in a year. This seriously shook the brand's positions. Meanwhile, within the company, disagreements and undercover wars reached a new level. From the very beginning, the director's chair was handed to people from Sony. Miles Flint, Hideki Komiyama, they were loyal to the Japanese side. But the Swedes also wanted to influence the brand. After all, Komiyama didn't show any results in a year and his actions led to a catastrophe. In the end, in October 2009, Bert Norberg from Ericsson was appointed as CEO. An interesting fact, Sonic is not the leader of Sony as many think. Sonic is a hedgehog. Suddenly, 2010 became a profitable year. In a year, the company managed to earn 90 million euros. However, this was not so much due to increased sales, but rather due to production optimization. Roughly speaking, they bought a significant portion of budget phones in China and India through ODM contracts and sold them with a hefty markup under their logo. The company tried to restore profitability by releasing more expensive products with mediocre technical specifications. Sales volume again decreased by 24.5%. The company tried to sit on all chairs at once and was not in a hurry to move away from the Windows Mobile. Yes, they only released three phones there, but they released more devices not on Android, but on Symbian. Among somewhat significant devices, the Sony Ericsson X8 and X10 Mini were released, but the rest were too specific. At the same time, the company was working on prospective developments. For example, in April 2010, when Apple introduced its first iPad, which revolutionized the concept of mobile computers, everyone and their grandmothers started making their iPad killer. Sony Ericsson also joined the race. They planned to launch a whole line of tablets. A lot of time, money, and human resources were spent on their creation, but due to the defunct R&D department, they couldn't make anything sensible. The leadership was not satisfied with the shortcomings of these tablets, and in the end, none of these devices made it to release. I wonder what the Sony Ericsson tablet could have been like if it were developed by old specialists who worked on the K750i, for example. Also in 2010, Sony Ericsson was developing a smartphone in collaboration with Vio. In 2020, a prototype of this device appeared on the network. The company wanted to unite the smartphone and laptop brands into one device with a retractable physical keyboard, but for unknown reasons, the project was also cancelled. 2011 is considered the year of the brand's closure. To some extent, it's even comical that in that year, the Sony Ericsson Xperia Play with PlayStation support was released. Once the idea of making a gaming smartphone became the apple of discord in the company and triggered internal wars. And now, here we are, and gaming phone comes out that no one needs anymore. 
On October 27, 2011, Sony officially announced that it was buying 50% of Sony Ericsson's shares for just over a billion euros from its partner. The deal would close in January 2012. Ericsson would transfer part of the patents and cross-licenses on patents used in the company's phones. Considering the value of the intellectual property that Ericsson owned at that time, the deal was measured in billions of dollars. But for Ericsson, it was important to get out of the business as soon as possible to avoid losing money. Moreover, they had been harboring such plans since 2008. Smartphones with the Sony Ericsson logo continued to be released until 2012, but the audience they were intended for remains a mystery. The great Sony Ericsson fell under the pressure of many factors, including the dissolution of the development department, Apple entering the smartphone market, the global crisis, pressure from parent companies, absolute closeness and disregard for user opinions, and the brand's clumsiness and absolute detachment from consumers. What about now? After completing the deal, Ericsson completely left the smartphone market. They are still one of the largest suppliers of base station equipment for 5G networks and are already eyeing 6G. They are also developing the Internet of Things. But what's even more interesting is that the company is suffering colossal reputational losses. It is involved in major corruption scandals and is currently actively suing the US authorities. From 2011 to 2017, Ericsson earned $427 million by having its representatives pay government officials and their families worldwide for expensive vacations and entertainment, offering bribes in cash and showering gifts in exchange for Ericsson winning tenders. In 2018, the company fired 50 employees for bribery. In 2019, it paid a hefty fine of $1.2 billion for corruption schemes. In 2021, history repeated itself. The company was again caught giving million-dollar bribes for government contracts. In 2022, Ericsson admitted to paying terrorists in Iraq to deliver equipment bypassing customs. As a result, the company's shares plummeted by 34% in two weeks. So, not everything is so smooth in the Swedish kingdom. After the acquisition, Sony began developing its mobile division with varying success and the company's characteristic closed attitude towards consumer opinions. The last Walkman smartphone is considered to be the Sony Ericsson Live with Walkman from 2012. The Walkman logo was later erased from Japanese devices, but its presence was retained as a system player. In 2015, however, they abandoned it in favor of Xperia Player. But Walkman players themselves are still being released and operate on Android to this day. There was a moment when Sony announced a complete withdrawal from the mobile market. But their success with devices like Sony Xperia 1 and Xperia 5 saved them. And today there's Xperia Pro and Xperia Pro 1. The company has innovative developments. However, they have not been able to replicate the success of old models.